today on Ask This Old House. Hey Ross, what do you got going there? Hey Tommy, I am testing out a new device for a stud finder. I'll come across and I'll see. Oh, there's our pipe. So there's a copper pipe right there. That's right. You're never gonna believe what happened to this floor. I'm heading to Oregon to show you how to fix it. I don't want to sand too deep in one spot. I want to feather it out. So the deeper the damage, the wider you should sand around it. I'll teach you everything you need to know about table saws. And the plantings in front of this house are a bit of a mess. I'll show you how to clean them up. In the future, everything should be pruned once a year just to keep it in check. For projects around the house, HomeAdvisor helps find local pros to do the work. You can check ratings, read customer reviews, and book appointments with pros online at HomeAdvisor.com. HomeAdvisor is proud to support Ask This Old House. Hey Ross, what do you got going there? Hey Tommy, I am testing out a new device for a stud finder. A stud finder? I always carry mine with me right here. I can always find true. the stud, yeah. But I never had good luck with those that's other That's right, ones. that's right. So this one's kind of cool though. It's got a device that works with a smartphone. Okay. All right, and the way that the device works is by sending radio signals into the wall. Radio signals? Yep, just like a wireless router or a cordless phone, baby monitor. Baby monitor. You know about a baby monitor. I sure do. <laughs> so those radio signals get sent into the wall, and based on the materials in that wall, it's going to absorb or reflect those radio signals differently. Differently. So okay. that from that, it can detect what it thinks is in the wall. Okay. Well, right. Let's see so, it working. So let me show you here. So if I put it on the wall, and I come across, all right, so it just found a pipe or a wire. And so that actually is the wire that's running from this switch to that receptacle. Okay. All right, if I keep coming along, I'm going to hit that wire a couple more times. If I move a little bit faster, though, I'll come across and I'll see. Oh. There's our pipe. So there's that copper pipe right there. That's right. If I keep coming across, then I see our wind stud. the stud. Yeah, well, well that's pretty that. good. Yeah, it's really cool. I like the fact that it tells you what it thinks it is. That's right. You know, that's good. So it's priced com uh, comparably with other high-end stud finders on the market. Okay. Uh, but it only works with certain uh, cell phones. It doesn't work with all of them. All right, and what about uh, plaster and lath? I know that's always tricky. Yeah, so this device is really designed for drywall and for concrete. Concrete? It works on concrete? It works on concrete, yeah. Well, that's pretty cool. And they're still working on plaster and lath, but they're not there yet. Well, plaster and lath, I've always had mine with me. Tried and true. Always know where it is. <laughs> well, thanks, Russ. Hi, Aaron. Hi, Nathan. Welcome to Portland. Thanks for having me. Wow, you have a lovely house here. Thanks. We really like it. We saw it on the first day of house hunting, put in an offer and got it that day. Wow, really? Yeah. That doesn't happen very often. It really doesn't. Come take a look inside. Okay. Wow, I can see why you guys love the house. Yeah, the old touches like the picture railing are one of the major reasons we decided to buy this home. That's a really nice touch. A lot of people don't even realize that it has that little lip and they can hang their pictures on it. Yeah, another thing we really love about this house are the wood floors. We think they're original to the home, which was built in 1907. They look like a Douglas fir, and they've aged really well with the house. Yeah, they look great, but there's one problem in here. It's right there. Oh, what's going on here? Um, my husband was ironing, and for some inexplicable reason, he set the hot iron face down on the floor. Do you guys not have an ironing board? We do. I think he was just in a hurry. <laughs> well, it looks like it just went below the surface, so I think it's a really easy fix. Let me go out to my truck, grab some tools, and we'll get started. Great, thanks. All right, so I want to get started by taking this blemish down layer by layer. Your floor looks pretty traditional, probably 5 8 Douglas fir, and it was most likely refinished 5 to 10 years ago using a water-based polyurethane. What I want to do is first cut through the finish, and for that I'm going to use a random orbital sander with 150 grit. I don't want to sand too deep in one spot. I want to feather it out. So the deeper the damage, the wider you should sand around it. Now I'm going to switch to 180 grit sandpaper. So 
So that's about all the power sanding that we want to do on this. Now we're just going to switch over to a sanding block with some 220 on it, and we're going to sand with the grain to fine tune it. Okay. You want to give it a try? Yeah. All right. All right, let's take a look. That feels nice and smooth. Yeah, it does, and you can't even see the burn mark anymore. Perfect. So now the last step we want before we do the polyurethane is use a tack cloth. What's that? Now it's just a cloth with a little tacky substance on it. Some people think maybe use a wet rag, but that'll actually raise the grain that we just sanded down. So we want to use this to take off all the fine dust before the polyurethane. Okay. Oh, wow, look at that. That picked up a lot. Well, let's get the polyurethane. Okay. You have a water-based polyurethane, so that's what I bought, and I bought it with a semi-gloss finish. All right, so we'll clean up this little dri dribble right here. And what we're going to apply it with is a two-inch nice bristle brush, and we're going to go with the grain. I'm going to focus on the middle and feather it out towards the edges. Wow, that looks great. What a difference. See how it darkens that fur right back up? Yeah, it looks really good. We're lucky it was just the finish on this wood. If there was a stain, it would be a lot harder to match. All right, let's let this dry for about an hour before applying the next coat. This is just a light pass with a 220 grit to give the next coat something to bite to. And we want to wipe it with the tack cloth to pull off any of the dust before we put the poly down. And now the second coat. All right, we'll let that dry. We'll sand it again and hit it with the third coat. Third coat's done, Aaron. What do you think? Wow, it looks great. I can't tell that anything even happened, and I didn't think it would be that easy. Thanks for coming to Portland, and thanks for your help. Thanks for having me. Tommy, where would you be without your table saw? Uh, I don't know where I'd be because we use them all the time. And this is a nice big one that we keep in the shop Yeah. because it's very heavy. You need two guys to carry it around at least. Cabinet saw, expensive. So a lot yeah. of people don't work off of one of these. Right. They work off of something more portable. Small portable saws are great. They're on the job site all the time. We have a few of them going all day long and yeah. back and forth. And this one's pretty cool because it's a battery operated Ooh, is one. Is that right? Yeah, you don't even have to plug it in. So you plug the battery in and you're good for a long time, a lot a of cuts. Way. So it's also one of the most dangerous tools out there. So you always have to be thinking about safety. Let's talk about some of the techniques when making cuts to keep us safe. All right, well, first of all, you have this, this protection right here to keep the sawdust off you. Try to keep your hands out of there. All right, blade. There's a riving knife down here. And this riving knife, as you push the wood through, it lessens the chance of it collapsing on itself or twisting and, and then pushing back. Right, which is kickback, which we do not want. Right, and these little teeth right here yeah. on these spring-loaded things, these are called pawls, right. and they actually will dig into the grain if the wood wants to kick back. And you can see when you push the wood through there. Right. As you run the board through, there's a piece on each side of the blade, and it comes through, and these little spring-loaded teeth pick up. Yeah. And then if this thing was going to kick back, it would, the teeth would dig in and it won't kick back at you. Right. All right. So let's make sure that we've got those on anytime we're using it. Um, a rip cut. Let's talk about that. Yep. A rip cut is when you go and you set the rip fence, the distance from the blade. And let's say I make it here and now I want to run it through and I want to make a cut. Yep. Now, what you don't want to do when you're doing a rip cut is, first of all, you want, I always keep my hand here, and I want to make sure I'm pushing the, the, the wood against the rip fence. Yep. I'm not looking at the cut. 
I'm looking at the position of the board in relationship to the rip vents. If there's a gap or a space on one end or this end, I'm not holding it straight. Right. So push it up there tight. Although it is possible that they're not parallel, right? Yes, and that's when you have to think about your adjustments. Yeah. So you want to make sure that this fence is parallel with that blade. Let me take this off so you can see right here. Yeah, we've got the battery out. We've got this thing shut down. Yep. yep. All right, so the first thing I would do when I take out a saw, I eyeball it. And I put the blade up as high as it'll go. Mm -hmm. And I just eyeball it, and I can look like, all right, so now if I lock that in, I look at the space between the blade here and the blade here to make sure that it's parallel. Looks pretty good, right? Looks pretty good, but I can check it. So by checking it, I'm going to create a space right here. And the space is big enough. First thing I would check is the distance from my rip fence to one of these two dados, okay? I check here, it's four and a half. It's four and a half. Now that's just random. I locked it in. This is, has to be locked in. The other thing I want to do is I want to make sure that it's parallel to the blade mm -hmm. because, you know, these saws get thrown around. They come out of the trucks, you guys drop them, they pick them up, they it throw happens. them around. It happens. Yep. So what you want to do is you want to pick one of the teeth. Yep. All right, because you have offsetting teeth. Let me show you this combination blade right here. And if you look at the teeth, one points to the right, one points to the left. Yep. All right, so if I measure from the wrong tooth, there's a little bit of a diff in it's the gonna, distance. That's going to show me that I'm out of parallel. Okay. So to find that I'm in parallel, I'm going to pick a tooth. I'm going to say right there. So now I have nine and a half inches from yep. this side of this tooth. I'm going to take this tooth and I'm going to rotate it back here. Mm. And I'm going to measure again. All right, nine and a half inches. Gotcha. So this fence is parallel to the saw, but really parallel to the blade. Right, which is key. And that's right. actually going to help us be safer by minimizing kickback. Right. Now, when making a rip cut or a cross cut, I like to first set the saw blade so that it just comes through, all right? Maybe quarter to a half an inch up at the most. Mm -hmm. All right, that lessens the chance for kickback. Right, and we want that blade height set correctly, whether we're doing a rip cut or a cross cut. Exactly. But when we're doing a cross cut, we're gonna take the fence pretty much out of the equation. Right, and let me show you here what, you, what happens if I use the fence and the blade is there. Let's say I wanna cut a bunch of boards and I want them to be like eight inches long. I would never take this piece here and run this through because look what can happen. If I'm pushing this with more leverage and holding this with less leverage, this board can jam in between the two mm -hmm. and kick back. And when it kicks back, it happens so quick. I've seen it happen on the job site. I've seen it happen in school when I was a kid. A kid was cutting the saw, pushing the board through, it kicked back and the blade was not up too high, so he didn't lose his fingers. Right. He just nicked them all. Yeah, it could drag your hand across the blade. It'll definitely throw that back at you. It's a bad situation. Right, and that's why I like the blade to just come up a little bit. So we don't use the fence. Right, you don't use the fence. You use this to make your cross cut. You put it on here. You hold it down firm to the table, and you pull it together and you push it across. Leaving a gap here between the end of the fence. Right. Now, let's say I want to cut multiple pieces that length. Yep. First thing you do is you take the, a scrap piece of wood, you take a measurement from the scrap piece of wood to the edge of the blade that you want, whatever it is. I then take this scrap piece of wood and I slide it all the way down to the very beginning of the rip fence. Mm -hmm. So now I have a guide or a stop that I can put my board against, hold it tight to the crosscut guide. That's going to set our length. Right. Now you see that this board is against this stop before it meets the blade. Mm -hmm. Now when I push it through, as I go through, there's a the gap board right here. Will, there's a gap. The board can fall off, and I can take and move it out of the way. Nice. It won't get caught on the blade. Good. All right, Tommy. Well, I love to see the battery coming into the uh, in the Vogue here for these saws. Yeah, and me too. Some good safety tips. Thank you. Thank you.
Hi, Jen. Thanks for coming. Thanks for having me. Nice, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, too. So, so what do we have here? So we have some issues going on on either <laughs> side of our walkway. Okay. Um, not really a, a green thumb type of person. We got this tall, skinny green bush. It's kind of just falling over. Mm -hmm. We got this one that looks like it's flattening out. I think it's a holly. Right, it is. Very good. And over here we have this rose bush that keeps... Attacking you as you go yeah. in. <laughs> and then we got some, some dying bushes over here. All right, so just looking at this quickly, I think over here, it could be a possible snow problem. I don't know if you shovel off to the side. I mean, Maybe this, that. Arborvitae want, this is an arborvitae and it wants to be upright and it might just not be in the right place anyways. Okay. And then the holly looks like it's just been crushed over the years and maybe not pruned. So moving on here, this is a juniper and it's actually, it looks like it's been here for a while and I think it adds a great vertical element mm -hmm. and gives balance to both sides of the house. So I think we keep this and prune out some of the dead wooden sign and then we'll reshape it. And then flanking it at the end with this really beautiful boxwood, I All think right. that stays. So those two are good, uh, good bones to the project. Um, and then over here, this rose is definitely in the wrong spot, um, but it could relive on in another spot. So thinking that might be a good transplant. Works for me. Um, you have a lot of good bones here. There's definitely good plantings that have been here for a while. So say this Japanese holly, I think we just tuck it in and prune it to reshape it. Okay. Um, this is an arborvitae and that's doing well. And this is a different type of arborvitae that might stay or go. This boxwood has definitely seen better days and I'd like to get it out, it out of here. Yeah. So what I'm thinking is we go through and do the removals that we want to do and then do the pruning and then we see what blank areas we have to work with and then we'll come up with a plan from there. That sounds great. All right, let's get working. All right. All right, so we're gonna take, start with taking this arborvitae out. Nice. Okay. All right. All right, I'm just gonna cut this back a little bit so we can, it'll be easier to dig out the base so we don't scratch ourselves. Got that? Yep. In the future, you know, everything should be pruned once a year just to keep it in check. Got it? Yep. Nice. All right. Okay, so we're gonna try to save this rose, right? Okay. So what I wanna do is cut it back to a couple feet high. So, and then we'll dig it up and put it in a pot and set it aside for wherever you may wanna transplant it. Sounds good. Okay. Okay, so you could be pretty aggressive when you cut this rose back because it's just gonna, it's gonna go, come back in full force. Okay, so we want to save this shrub. It's a Japanese holly. Um, it just needs to be pruned back a little bit. So what I want to do is follow these long offshoots, follow it back down to the crotch or the V of the plant, snip it right there. Would it be right around here? Yep. What we also want to pay attention to is keeping these two as separate plants. The arborvitae is its own, this is its own. So if you prune it and keep along with it, you could have them always be their own individual plant. How far down do I want to take this one down to? All the way? If you're unsure, go halfway, and then if it doesn't look right, see, I think that looks good. Looks good to me. Mm -hmm. This one I think could. And sometimes take a step back and look at the shape. Like if you like how the shape looks, because sometimes you don't see it when you're in it. If you have a different perspective, look at it from where you're going to be walking by. Does anything else bother you? Not um, at the moment. All right. I just see a few more pieces that okay. are touching, only like right here, that are touching the arborvitae, so. Perfect. Okay, Amy, so I've staged all the plants for you to approve. Oh, wow, it looks great. Excellent. So what we have here are all perennials and grasses. So what happens to these during the winter, they become dormant and they go underground. So when you're shoveling your path, you could pile all the snow you want right on top. Oh, that's convenient. It's gonna be great. Another thing here for design principle wise, I tried to pick different bloom times. So you want spring, summer bloomers, fall. It's just, it's nice to have different things going off at different times in the garden. Um, and also the texture, this dwarf fountain grass. I love that. Yeah, the texture is beautiful. The plumes come out in the fall and it's anchored by these two sedum stone crops on either side. Totally different shape and structure from the fountain grass. 
uh, it, all the, but they have same bloom times and it's about to flower pink and it just has this more of a lumpy roundish irregular shape to it um, but even when it's not flowering the foliage looks it looks beautiful it is beautiful mm -hmm. uh, and traveling down this way we have some echinacea which is this beautiful red cone flower and that will be a summer bloomer for you that's beautiful and traveling over here where your arborvitae was tipping over remember i remember that i wanted to have some height here still so these this is a switch grass so it's going to help hide the foundation give you that nice vertical element but again these will die back in the winter but we have texture we have height we have the salvia which is a may bloomer but when you cut it back in, after it blooms in May, it's going to rebloom for you. Over here, we have some anemones, which are great fall bloomers. They're absolutely beautiful. And then over there, repeating the ladies' mantle. So it'll all connect and tie in together. Awesome. So if you approve, I think we could start planting. It's approved. Let's do it. All right, let's do it then. Then pull up the soil, put it to the side, squeeze the pot. So what you want to do is tease it a little bit. Now, why do you do that? Okay, so in a pot, sometimes roots tend to become pot bound and they start to grow in a circle. And by teasing the roots, you're breaking them out so they could reach out into the soil. Backfill, and you wanna leave it a little bit high because we are gonna mulch. I, I plant everything in threes or fives. I mean, there's no reason why they're odd numbers. Sometimes I do fours, but it's, it makes more of an impact when plant just grows together as one big plant instead of putting one here, one here, one here. I think it's more of a visual impact. I bet it looks nice once they're all grown together. It does. I guess it's a personal preference too. Okay, so the final stage is mulching. And then let's just sprinkle it around the plant, but don't cover the base of the plant. Okay. Finally, we'll give everything a good watering. Okay, so your homework is to water the plants until they're established and then cut them back at the end of the season. I think I can handle that. It really looks fantastic. It really does. I mean, it's so welcoming. The colors, the textures, the heights. Everybody thinks you need to put heavy shrubs for foundation plantings, but you could just see just adding those perennials for color really helps out a lot. Well, I really can't thank you enough. Well, keep them alive. I'll try. All right, nice to meet you. Have a good day. Take care. Thanks for watching. This old house has got a video for just about every home improvement project, so be sure to check out the others. And if you like what you see, click on the subscribe button. Make sure that you get our newest videos right in your feed.